guys, it is, it is such an honor to be with you today. I want to ask you, if you would, if you brought a Bible, to open up to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter. Um, if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. I'm going to have the scriptures behind me. I'll be preaching through um, the very first verse today of 1 Peter. We're beginning um, our walk through the book of 1 Peter, if, if this is your first time at the Stone, if you're new, one of the things we've done since the very first Sunday here at the church is we walk verse by verse through the scripture. Um, there are times we'll have series where we'll kind of break away and, and do other stuff in the text, but we love to take a book of the Bible and go verse by verse through that. We do that because we believe that our preaching and the power, rather, of our preaching doesn't come from our words, but comes from the word of God. Um, last thing you want to do is hear some redneck from East Texas talk about stuff. But if I'm up here and I'm speaking from the word of God, then I've got something to say. Amen? Y'all with me? So that's why we're doing what we're doing. And so let me tell you what's going on here in the book of First Peter, because kind of to understand the context of why Peter is writing this letter to this group of Christians back in the early church, you have to understand kind of the history of what's occurring. Now, we don't know exactly when Peter wrote this letter. Um, he wrote it sometime in the early AD 60s, in like the early 60s AD, and what was occurring at the time, and we know this historically, is right in the middle of the 60s there, there was an intense, really... Um, unimaginable persecution that occurred towards Christians of the early church. And I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute. And so what's happening here is that Peter writes a letter, the apostle Peter, he writes a letter to these Christians, um, one, because he wants them to maintain their faith. He wants them to maintain their faith in the, in the midst of this intense persecution. He's writing them to remind them that they are called to endure in their faith no matter what they're going through. And the reason he tells them, and we're going to see this as a theme throughout all the book, but the reason he tells them that they need to hold on to their faith in Christ no matter what happens in their life, no matter what trial comes in their life, and he's going to tell them this, is because heaven is coming. There is coming a day where you're going to be standing face to face with Jesus and all the suffering you ever went through in your life will be worth it because of Jesus. And so that's why he's writing them this letter. And so I want you to understand the context of it. And so we're gonna look at the very first verse and that's all we're looking at today because the verse first tells us who he's writing, why he's writing, and it, it uh, kind of gives us an overview of the entire book. So let's read this together. First Peter chapter one, verse one. <clears throat> Peter says, Peter, and he says his name, <clears throat> and he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithia. So he begins this letter, and he writes his name. He says, hey, everybody, I'm Peter. And he says something interesting. It's a phrase that if you're like me, you grew up, you've read it a thousand times, and you just breeze past it. He says, my name is Peter, and I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, why does he call himself, let's stop for just a second, and why does he call himself an apostle? Now, in, in the New Testament times, the, the original 12 apostles of the church were the 12 disciples of Jesus minus Judas because Judas betrayed Christ and killed himself. And so there was 11. The apostle Paul eventually comes in and, tw and takes that 12 apostleship position. But the way that you became an apostle was this. You had to have two unique, little theology lesson here. You had to have two unique qualifications to be called an apostle in the early church. The first qualification was this. is You had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus. You had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. You couldn't be a person that just heard that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. To be one of the 12 apostles, you had to be somebody that saw him with your own eyes. And the second qualification was this, is that you had to be commissioned by Jesus himself as an apostle. You couldn't just run around and say, hey, I'm an apostle. You had to be somebody that could claim that Christ himself commissioned him into the ministry. And so Peter, <coughs> excuse me, in Peter's case, he fits uh, both of those qualifications. We know scripturally that Peter saw Jesus after Jesus rose from the grave. He walked with him on the road to Emmaus. He had dinner with him. Um, if y'all remember that Peter 
Um, he, was, he felt all this guilt because he denied Jesus three times on the night of Jesus' crucifixion. And he, he takes off and he goes to the beach and Jesus pursues him. And so not only does Jesus meet him on the beach, he cooks him breakfast, but in that moment as they're standing face to face, Jesus, remember what Peter, or rather Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, I want you to leave here. I want you to know I forgive you, I love you, and I want you to go feed my sheep. Peter, I want you to leave the beach here, and from now on, I want you to go be a minister of the gospel. I want you to shepherd my flock. And so Peter meets those two qualifications. He saw Jesus face to face after the resurrection, and Jesus specifically calls him into the ministry. And so when Peter starts his letter off in the first sentence, and he says, hey, my name's Peter, and I'm an apostle of Jesus. Christ. He's not just giving a polite introduction or that's not what, just what you did. He's reminding everybody of his unique qualification to speak to them on behalf of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> I hear there's a phrase gets thrown out in the church a lot. You hear people say, people say this to me. They're like, Matt, I've got a word from the Lord for you. And people come up and say that all the time. I've got a word from God for you. And here's the thing. They may or they may not have a word from the Lord. But when Peter writes these, these people and he says, hey, I'm an apostle of Jesus, that was Peter's way of saying that exact same thing. Hey, church, Christians, I have a word from God for you. Except in Peter's case, it was an actually a word from God. All right, so that's what's happening here. Let's read it again. He says, I'm, I'm Peter, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now watch what he says next because he's gonna tell us who he's writing the letter to who he's writing a letter to, and he, and he calls them something um, pretty unique here in, in, the, in the scripture. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Now, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church in, in Asia Minor, current day Turkey, where this is, and he calls them something pretty interesting. He says, I'm an apostle, I've got a word from the Lord to you, and I'm writing to the elect exiles. Why does he call them that? Well, the word um, elect means chosen. It means chosen. He says you are chosen. And the word exile, the word exile there means stranger or alien or sojourner. Okay, now he doesn't, again, he doesn't write him and say, hey, I'm Peter, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, I got a word from the Lord to you, and I'm writing all the Christians who have been dispersed throughout Pontius and Galatia and Cappadocia. He doesn't, write, he doesn't say that. He doesn't write them and say, hey, I'm Peter. I'm an apostle of Jesus, and I'm writing to all the people that, that go to church who live in these areas of the world. He says, I'm Peter, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, I got a word from the Lord for you, and I'm writing to the chosen exiles that are living all over this area of the world. Now again, why does he do that? And here's the answer. <clears throat> he calls them that because right there in the very first sentence of this book, he's hitting one of the major themes of the entire book of 1 Peter. It's one of the major themes of the entire book, and I want you to hear it. He's reminding them right out of the blocks what he's calling them. He's reminding them that they are not followers of Christ by accident. He's reminding them by what he calls them that they are going through what they're going through in life, enduring this persecution, not by accident. He's reminding them that they are going through the trials, that they're experiencing the trials that they're experiencing, not by accident, listen, but because they were chosen. Because they were chosen. Now, here's the thing. In the very next verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, and we'll see it next week, he basically comes right out and says it. He's saying, that, hey, guys, I want you to understand something. All this stuff is happening according to the foreknowledge of of God. It's one of the major themes in the book. And I don't know if you're like me, but when you first read that and, and you first hear that, it kind of takes you back. It, it freaks you out and you're like, man, I'm looking at this. I'm studying this. That's really what he's saying, that all this, is, all this stuff is occurring in their lives. God knew about it. He chose them for it. And when you hear it, it kind of messes you up and freaks you out. But one of the things you're going to see in this book as we go through it step by step is you're going to realize, and I've realized over the years, that one of the most comforting things that you will ever hear in your life is that your trials do not take God by accident. It's one of the, it was one of the things that, that I just, as a guy that's been walking with the Lord for a while, it's one of the things that I've learned and I've gotten my brain around and it's one of the comfort, most comforting things I have ever learned is that my suffering, my trials, do not take God by surprise, but that God is with me 
in the midst of all that suffering. And that if I am a person who loves the Lord and is called by his name, which I am, then the scripture promises us that he is at work for my good in the midst of that suffering. And so that he kind of, out of the blocks, he comes out and he says, hey, I just want to remind you guys. I want to comfort you folks that are going through these crazy trials that you are a chosen race that you are a holy priesthood that God's hand has and always has been on you, all right? Now, he goes on, (coughs) he calls him something else, he calls him an exile. He says, you're a chosen exile, chosen stranger, a chosen alien. And why does he call him that? Again, these are Christians. Well, he's not calling that, listen, he's not calling that primarily. This is something I learned this week. Because you hear it and you say, well, he's obviously talking about these people that were scattered But as you look more deeply into it, he's not calling them exiles because they weren't living in their original country, even though many of them weren't. He calls them exiles, listen, to remind them of their identity in Jesus. That if you're a Christian, one one of the things that defines your identity in Christ is that you are an exile, okay? He's, and this is what that means. He's trying to explain to them and remind them and write to them in the midst of their suffering. Look, there's a reason that the world is hostile to you. It's because you're not of this world. He, he's writing them and reminding them. And there, there, there's a reason that you don't feel like a citizen of this place. And the reason that is is because you're not a citizen of this place. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, which I don't, I don't think I have the, the scripture with me, but it, it says, and this is Paul speaking, he says, but our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await from it, that's heaven, a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the major themes in the book of First Peter. In the letter, he's saying, look, your citizenship is not of Asia Minor or these different cities. Our citizenship is not the United States of America. We are citizens of a different place, a different time, a different place. It's heaven. And he's saying this. This is the theme. This is the point. Peter's reminding them, look, you can endure anything. There's not a trial that you can't overcome when you realize that this place is not your home. This world's not your home. You've got a different home that's coming. You've got a different citizenship that's waiting on you. And when that day comes, all this stuff that you went through will have been worth it. He says, Peter, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ and I'm writing to those who are the chosen exiles. That's who he's writing to. And then at the end, he says something that kind of gives us a little bit of insight into why he's writing the letter. I'll read it to you. He says, to those who are chosen exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, he's writing to these believers, these chosen exiles, these Christians who've been scattered all throughout the world at the time because of various different reasons. Um, A lot of scholars try to pin it down and say it was just persecution, that was part of it, but a lot of it was because the gospel was spreading. The young church was telling everybody they could about Jesus. A lot of people just lived there originally. But, and so we can't say that there was one reason why these people were dispersed. There was a lot of reasons, but there's something that happened in the middle of the 60s there in AD that gives us some, some pretty strong insight into why Peter is writing this letter and why he keeps talking about suffering and trials over and over and over again. And it's something that happened on July 19th, 64 AD. Now don't shout it out, but you history majors out there, anybody know what happened on July 19th? 19th, 64 AD, it's an important date. In a lot of ways, you and I are sitting here today in this room because of what happened on that day on July 19th, 64 AD. What happened was there was this huge fire that broke out in Rome and it covered the city of Rome incredibly quickly. Rome, the, the precipices and stuff were built by wood at the time and so and the streets were really narrow and so the fire just ravaged the city. It burned for three days and three nights and they couldn't get it under control. And finally they got it under control. All these people died and then it started back up again and kind of the second wave of fire was worse than the first. Now the emperor of Rome at the time was a guy named Nero. It's a guy named Nero. And all these people were freaking out because they couldn't get the fire under control and so everybody kind of turned on Nero and started thinking he was probably the one that set this town on fire because he loved to build stuff and they thought you probably set it on fire because you just want to rebuild the city again again and so everybody turns on Nero and Nero had this great idea. 
He starts looking for a scapegoat. He starts thinking, who can I blame this on so nobody's gonna blame me? And he remembers that there's this, this new group of people called Christians. And nobody, nobody really knew what they were about and everybody kind of thought they were weird. And so what he thought he would do is he would blame the Christians for this fire in, in church. Everybody bought the story. Everybody bought the story. And there was a persecution that broke out because of what Nero said um, that happened to our brothers and sisters in Christ that has been just about unparalleled in history. The suffering that the young Christian church went through because of Nero in the middle of the 60s is unimaginable. And I wanna just read a little quote to you. <clears throat> this is from a guy named Tacitus, and he was a, a Roman historian and a Roman senator. He was not a Christian. He, he was just a, a, a Roman guy, and he wrote this um, this. Uh, this book called Annals, and it was just a history of the Roman Empire, and I want you to read a quote. This is one of the first non-biblical, non-religious references to Christ that we have in history, and it was written in 116 AD, about 50 years after the fire, and I'll read it to you. This is, uh, this is Tacitus speaking, and he says, um, neither human assistance in the shape of imperial gifts nor attempts to appease the gods could remove the sinister report that the fire was due to Nero's own orders. And so he's saying the rumor's going everywhere that Nero was this one that started the fire. And so in hope of dissipating the rumor, he falsely diverted the charge onto a set of people who he gave the name of Christians and who were detested for the abominations they perpetrated. And so what does he mean when he say they were detested for the abominations they perpetrated? Well, there's a couple of things going on why people hated Christians at the time. One, they were saying there's not all these multiple gods, there's one God. And, and, and the king who you think's the king, he's not the king, there's a different king. And then rumors were going around that they used to drink blood and eat flesh, and that's coming from communion. And so everybody thought these people are weird, they're messed up. And then and, and this is, again, one of the first non-religious references to Christ <clears throat> in a secular book. He says, the founder of the sect, one Christus by name, had been executed by Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius, and the dangerous superstition, though put down for a moment, broke out again, not only in Judea, the original home of the pest. He calls Jesus a pest, but even in Rome. And so again, because of this fire, this persecution broke out, and it was unbelievable. Tacitus writes about it in a couple of paragraphs later. He says, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, talking about Christians, the young church, and covered with skins of beasts, and they were torn by dogs and perished, or they were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flame. Listen to this. They were doomed to flames and burned to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. I went and did some studying on this and what he would do, Nero would round up Christians and he would sew animal skins, wild animal skins onto their skin. And then he would, put, you know, he would send his dogs after them to, to kill them and eat them alive. And they crucified him, we know what that means. And then they would roll them, that last part there, he would roll them in tar and oil and they would put them on stakes and they would set them ablaze, put these Christians, set them ablaze and so it would light, illuminate his gardens in the city at night. So that's what these people that Peter is writing to are enduring. Now again, we don't know exactly when it happened, exactly whether this happened right before he wrote the letter, right after he wrote the letter, we're not sure, but here's the point. There is a persecution that is occurring within a year or two of the writing of this letter. And it is, it is nothing like we've ever seen before or since. And so I want you to remember, whether you show up next week or you come two weeks from now or you show up five weeks from now and we're still in this letter, I want you to remember something. Peter is not writing to these churches to correct some theological issue. It's not like Paul writing the book of Galatians where he's addressing the, the Jewish Christians who are like, okay, I know you're Christians, but you still have to keep the law. That's why Galatians was written. But Peter's not doing that. He, he's not writing a, a letter to these churches like Luke was in Acts, talking about the history of Christianity. I want you to not forget throughout this entire se se uh, series that Peter is writing, writing a letter to strengthen the faith of a group of men and women and children who are in jeopardy of their very lives. They're in jeopardy of their very lives. <clears throat> and he writes them to give them hope. He writes them to give them hope. And hear this, because the hope that he offers them is a very different hope than you're gonna hear if you turn on the TV and watch preaching today. 
We live in a culture of the health and the wealth gospel. So if you follow God, everything's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be great. God's gonna bless you. And what you're gonna see in the word of God is that's not at all what Peter says. Peter never gives them hope in the midst of their suffering that they're going to be safe. He never says that. He never offers them the hope that they're going to be free from their suffering. But the hope that he offers them is that no matter what they go through, no matter what they experience, that God is going to be with them in their suffering. And the hope that he offers them is that no matter what they go through, that God will be with them in their suffering and because God is with them in their suffering, because they are a chosen people, that their suffering is never without purpose. That's one of the most beautiful things about being a believer that you and I can hold on to no matter what we go through in our life is we can know because the Bible promises us that no matter the suffering, our suffering is never one second of our lives without purpose. And all through the scripture, he gives them again the hope that there is coming a day. That there is coming a day where Jesus is gonna come back. He's like, I know you're you're living in a culture and it's going, everything is falling apart. I know you're living in a place where everybody's trying to kill you. I know that it is as bleak as it can be, but I want you to know something, people. There is coming a day where Jesus is gonna come busting through the clouds, the trumpet's gonna sound, and he's gonna make everything right because every knee's gonna bow. Every tongue is gonna confess that Jesus Christ is in fact Lord. And then he's gonna tell them this. He's gonna say, if you can just hold on, I know it's bad, but if you can just hold on, and you're standing there on that day at the revelation of Jesus, Peter says, when the whole world knows that he's the Lord. He's like, if you can hold on till that day, and if you can stand there on that day and you still have your faith, if your faith hasn't been burned up by the trials, if your faith hasn't been abandoned because of the fire, if your faith hasn't been thrown to the side because of everything you're going through, if you're standing there at the revelation of Jesus and you are still holding on to your faith, Peter says, I want you to know that that faith you're holding on to in Christ is more precious and is more valuable than gold. Because on that day, that faith will result in the praise and Jesus giving you praise and honor and glory and eternal life. All through the book, you're gonna hear Peter say, endure. Don't give up. Keep walking. You're not alone in this world. And there's coming a day where it's all gonna make sense. We're preaching this book for a couple of reasons. And I'm gonna give you the two and we're, we'll be done. We decided to preach First Peter. <coughs> Holland was begging us to go Old Testament again. I wouldn't let him do it. And... Um, and we chose First Peter because, church, we find ourselves in a culture. We find ourselves in a culture that is growing increasingly hostile to Christianity. Um, around the world in 2016, if you follow this kind of stuff, I do, 2016 was one of the years in all of recorded history where more believers were martyred than just about any other time. It's right up at the top of the list. There was over 4,000 believers that we know of that were actually martyred. I'm not talking about persecuted. I'm talking about actually died for their faith. And um, that's, that doesn't count countries like North Korea and places like that where we have no way to count. And so it was an, it, persecution just internationally because of Christian faith is growing and it's growing in intensity. It's getting bad. But here's the thing, because we're, we're a little bit shielded from that. We're a lot shielded from that kind of stuff. But here's the thing that also hit me, and, just, and I'm going I'm to jump into opinion land here, so bear with me. But I, I think that we are living in a country that for the first time that I'm aware of, definitely in my lifetime, and probably in the history of our country, that because of our beliefs, our Christian beliefs, the culture is looking at us and saying that's evil. That's evil. And I'm not talking about like fringe, Christian, crazy, Westboro Baptist idiot kind of theology. I'm talking about just normal, 2,000-year-old, orthodox, Christian, 
biblically founded beliefs, stuff like um, the biblical view of marriage, stuff like the, the, the biblical view of sexuality, like the biblical um, view of gender, just stuff like that. It's been around for a really long time, and all of a sudden, the culture is looking at Christians, and they're not saying, oh, I disagree with you. They're looking at Christians and our beliefs, and they're saying, you are evil. You're evil. It's a scary time. <clears throat> and I... Um, I went to a conference, I got invited to a conference. It was, I'm not gonna tell you the name of it. They asked us not to talk about the name of it or tweet about it, but it was an invitation only. It was just a handful of pastors got invited and um, there was a lot of media types. There was a lot of folks that were um, governors and senators that were there. And it was put on by a group of lawyers. And the sole purpose of this group was a big group of lawyers. And the sole purpose of this group of lawyers is to represent Christians who are coming under suit by the federal government here in our country. And, and you think, well, Matt, how many can that be? It can't be that many. Well, it was over a thousand. And we went through, we went through three days, and it, it, it was kind of boring at times, but they just kind of went case after case after case where they talked about and, and shared these stories of Christians, just normal people like you and me that are losing everything. They're losing everything in our country because they took some sort of stand for what they believe to be biblical. And um, one of the people that they had at the conference, <clears throat> and they brought her up on the stage, was that lady. This is one of the stories that the media actually covered, but it was the, the lady that um, had gotten in so much trouble because she didn't do the wedding of the same-sex marriage. Uh, she was a florist. You might have heard of that in the media. And they brought her up, and they interviewed her. Guys, she's like 68 years old. And they brought her up, she's about this tall. And she told the story of how that happened. And I don't know if she's lying or not, but I'm gonna tell you what she said. And this is what she said. She said that the guy um, <clears throat> that this all started with was, um, he was gay. She knew he was gay. They had been friends for 10 years. She said, I knew his name, he knew my name, he had a business that required him to buy a lot of flowers, I was his florist. We've known each other, talked to each other for a decade. We were on, we were friends. He said, she, she said, he came up to me one day and said, hey, I want you to know I'm getting married and I'd love for you to be my florist for my wedding. And um, she said that she grabbed his hand put his hand in hers and held it. And she called him honey. <laughs> she said, honey, I, I want you to know I love you and I'm glad you're getting married, but I can't do it. And she said to us, she said, I tried with everything that was in me to say that as gently as I could. She said, I, I'm, I just can't do it. She said, I'm a follower of Jesus and I just, I just don't feel like I can do that. And she gave him the name of a florist that was down the street that was an excellent florist. And he said, this is what he said to her. He said, I totally understand, totally get it. They hugged and he left the room. Well, that night, he goes home, tells his fiance, and it hits the internet. She said, by the next morning, there is a group of about 100 people that are screaming at her, yelling at her, cussing her out. She said she got dozens and dozens and dozens of death threats within the course of the next few days. Police had to put barricades up 24, um, 24 seven around the clock protection and her business, it's, it's pretty much done. And the guy that was interviewing asked her a question because she saw this guy in court because they sued her. She saw this guy in court. She said he wouldn't look at her. He wouldn't look at her the whole time. And the guy that was interviewing this lady so if you could say something to your friend, what would you say to him? And she starts crying. I mean, just sweet old lady starts, starts bawling. And she says, I would tell him that I love him. And I would tell him that I hope that I can have his business for another 10 years. And the world is looking at that and they're saying that is evil. And I sat there and I listened to Case after case after case after case after case. And folks, it would blow your mind if you knew the intensity with which our government was coming after believers for stuff like that. 
over the last four to five years and you don't know about it because the media didn't talk about it. But here's the thing, I left that conference and I just confess to you that I was genuinely afraid. You can ask my wife, genuinely shook me up. And I'm like, what, is, what are my kids, what kind of world are my kids gonna grow up in? And I had to go to the Bible and I had to gospel myself and I had to go to places like First Peter and remember the word of God that says, look, this kind of stuff is gonna happen. And I had to remind myself the words of Christ that said, you are going to be persecuted, not because of you, but you're gonna be persecuted, Jesus said, because of, because of me, Jesus says. It's going to happen, it's going to come. And I had to go back to all over, the, all over the scripture where over and over and over and over and over again, Jesus says, do not fear, for I am with you. Because we wanted to preach this book, because I want you to understand something. I think the days of casual Christianity are coming to an end. I think the days where you can just kind of say you're a Christian but not actually believe it that much or live it out are coming to an end. Because if you think about it, back in the days of Nero, if somebody walked up to you and said, are you a Christian? The only reason you say yes is because you believe with all your heart that there was a guy named Jesus that actually got out of the grave. If you believe in your heart that, that Christ was raised from the grave, that's the only way that you have the courage to say, yes, he in fact is Lord. I, th- I, don't, I, don't, I, I hope, I pray, that I don't, I don't think that the persecution, persecution is gonna come to America like it came there at the time of Nero, but I'm telling you this, I think the days where we can raise our hand and say we're a Christian but not really believe it are coming to an end, I think there's gonna be a line in the sand that's gonna be drawn and you're gonna have to make a decision whether your faith is genuine or it's not because there are gonna be consequences if we have a genuine faith. It's coming. And so we want to preach this, we wanna preach it faithfully so that it would accomplish in you what Peter and the Holy Spirit meant for it to accomplish in the original audience, which is that you would not lose your faith if and when in our lifetime the persecution comes. Lastly, it's this, and let's forget about persecution for a second. Let's just talk about suffering. Let's talk about trials, because Peter talks a lot about just regular old, good old fashioned suffering. And, and, and here's the thing, there are three kind of people in this room right now in the sound of my voice. There's people who are suffering. You know who you are. I'm not talking about persecution. I'm talking about a bad marriage. I'm talking about a a tough uh, relationship with your parents. I'm talking about a a really difficult roommate. I'm talking about a bad job. I'm talking about addiction. I'm talking about you are right now walking through suffering and trials in your life. You can raise your hand and go, yep, that's me. Cancer, that's me. There's another group of people, and that's people that by the grace of God are coming on the other side of suffering. You've been suffering for a while, and by the grace of God, you're kind of stepping out of it, and there's a third group of people, and that is the group of us that is about to walk into suffering. There's only three kinds of people in this world. Suffering, just got finished done with suffering, about to start suffering. And Peter writes this book, this letter, and we're gonna preach this letter for this reason, because the promise of the word of God is this, is that after the trial is over, that trial is either going to have burnt up your faith or it will have made your faith pure. And we wanna be a people that on the day of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we are standing there with a pure faith. That's why we do what we do, all right? Um, What we're gonna do is we're gonna end the message today. I've got just a little three minute video that our, our team put together, it's amazing. It just kind of summarizes the whole book of First Peter. We're gonna show it, I'm gonna pray, Aaron's gonna come up and lead us in worship. So watch the video. Peter wrote a letter to churches in the Roman Empire nearly 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Christianity had spread across the empire, but this new movement was not welcome. And why would it be? Rome was the strongest empire the world had ever seen, and their emperor was considered a god. Yet Christians, 
And Christians declared Jesus' kingdom was the only one that would last forever and that Jesus was the only one to be worshiped. Soon Christians were heavily persecuted for their message. They were imprisoned and tortured, even burned alive. The Roman Empire was where these believers lived, but it was certainly not their home. They were aliens, silenced, marginalized, outsiders, unwelcome in their own society. Peter's letter offered these brothers and sisters hope, but not through asserting their rights or retreating from their communities. Instead, Peter told believers to suffer with joy because that is exactly what Jesus had done. Peter told them to honor all people in a culture that favored the powerful. Peter told them to honor the emperor, even though he would persecute them mercilessly. He told them to suffer as Jesus suffered, to entrust themselves to their creator and to remember that this broken world was not their home. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Peter wrote. Then he charged them, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have a home waiting for us, an eternal home where we will glory in the pleasures of Christ forevermore. But millions and millions of others do not. This world is the best home they will ever have. So, Peter's charge to first century Christians rings true for us today. Stand firm. Stand firm with the light of Christ always before you. Fight the lion who prowls. Fight the lies that destroy. Fight with blessing and service. Fight in humility and grace. Fight with joy, hope, and love. Fight knowing Jesus has already won, is still winning, and will win forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Yeah, you can clap. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would be a church that is known by our love for people. For without it, we're a clanging symbol, a gong that nobody listens to. So I pray we'd be known by our love, but also, Lord, I pray that we would be known as people that believe in something that is transcendent beyond the whims of the culture. And that is your word, God. Father, I pray you would strengthen us, refine us, purify us. And God, I thank you that we're in a room this morning that we can stand up and sing at the top of our lungs. Thank you for that. You're worthy of it. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together.